we think of weaning, a lot of times when we think of precondition, we think of the vaccines, but there's a whole lot more to this story than just the vaccines. And so we're going to talk about environment, your facilities, some management things, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about vaccinations as well. So environment, as you're getting prepared to do this, um, think about where you're going to wean your, your calves into, what facilities, what lot. And uh, I, I took pictures here, you know, you, we don't want to wean our calves into a muddy, wet, and then have, as Pat had said, may, may, normally we, in September we might have more rain. And so that would be more of a concern. It looks like we, we're going to be relatively dry here that they'll, they'll be able to facilitate this a little better. The other thing is if you can wean onto a grass paddock like the lower picture, and these are actually some of our heifers that we, we keep our animals with a, another producer, but uh, we, we, if we can, we like to wean them to a lot to begin with, but then quickly open them up to a grass pasture so they can get out of it would turn muddy, we could get them out of that. And, and certainly, um, if we're if you're doing a fence line weaning, then really need to be careful on what your fence line is so the calves don't go through to the mothers. And, and we usually try to do that. Um, our lots where we wean is not this muddy corner, but in, in others we have it where the calves and mothers can touch. Now, the problem though is if it gets muddy, the, the cows and the calves will really muddy that up along the fence line as they spend a lot of time there. So, so one thing, what are you preparing for um, as far as the lots go and, and where are you going to and make sure making sure that that's going to be a hopefully a dry and a cool place. And when we think about facilities continuing along that line, uh, bunk space, a lot of times we're, we just, oh, we're going to wean a bunch of calves and we're going to feed them at a bunk, but we, we should be thinking of how much space do we have. And, and what you want for these wean calves, because they're going to come and eat all at the same time usually, you want 18 inches or a foot and a half per calf of bunk space so that they can comfortably all come and eat at the same time. And uh, the picture on the upper right is are some of our bull calves. And I think what we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So, so we need at least uh, about 16 to 18 feet. And those bunks there are eight foot. So we actually have 24 feet of bunk space for, for that group of bulls. So there's plenty of space for them to, to feed them and have them all be at the bunk at the same time. The other biggie is water. Now, um, you know, you got to step back and think, you know, where are the calves? Where have they been getting water out in the pasture? Are they used to coming to a waterer? Are they drinking out of ponds? Or are the waters, is it a big tank like on the left? Or is it like a, a water on the right? And then the other thing to think about is, does the water have a flap on it? Okay, or a ball. Um, so if the calves aren't used to that prior to weaning, you might have to provide them with, ex with uh, other water options until they understand that they can get water from those, those waters that maybe have a ball or a flap um, to, to um, be able for them to consume the water. So being aware of that is important as well, because if, if you wean them and they don't know how to use the water, um, that's going to impact their health down the road. Um, management, uh, manage, other management things to think about is timing. Um, hopefully you're looking at the forecast and once again, it looks like it's going to be relatively dry. Um, but uh, looking forward to, you know, don't, don't look and see that we're going to have five days in a row of, of wet and so the calves look like that on the right uh, where it's muddy and, and it, they don't want to lay down and and that's going to just add stress. So if you can time it for dry, cool weather, that's fantastic. Um, one of the things um, I'm sure Dr. Bailey will talk about creep feeding. I'm, I personally, personally, I'm not a big fan of creep feeding, um, partly because I'm raising registered heifers and I don't want them to get too fat, but Dr. Bailey can discuss that in, in, in you, your own farm. May, that might be a different story. 
but I do like to expose the calves while they're on the cows to some type of grain. Um, so they, they've got some taste of it. So when we do wean, it's not totally new to them. Okay, and, and a lot of times when we're working our cows, we're using the grain to call the cows in and, and the calves will get in there when we're, when we're putting out grain to bring the cows in. So that usually works fairly well and they transition to uh, the grain after weaning pretty well anyways. The other thing, and I, I had a longer talk with Dr. Payne on this one, um, contemporaries. So um, when we wean these calves, uh, we want to wean them as a group and we'd like to wean them all at one time, okay? Now, if you have multiple groups, so what you don't, let's say you have group A and group B, you don't wanna group wean group A and let them settle down for a week to two weeks and then wean group B and put them in um, into group A, okay? So, so in looking at these two pictures, let's say that the one on the left, right on the right, let's say we wean the group on the right first. When we come to wean those on the left, we don't want to, we don't want to wean them and throw them in the pen with the other ones. That, that's, um, Dr. Payne, is that's a great way to lead to problems, illnesses um, with the, the younger calves, okay? So if, if you have multiple groups, you want to have multiple areas to wean to, or you want to wean a group and then get them out before you bring in the next group. Okay, so something to think about. If you're big enough, you're gonna have multiple groups, either have multiple spots or wean one group, get them out, and then wean the next group, okay? So, so you're not mixing um, different sizes and different groups and, and different ages together, okay? And then backgrounding. So a, a lot of these um, uh, preconditioning programs will require you to wean them and leave them, leave them wean for a certain amount of days. Some programs are 30 days, most are 40, 45 days. Um, and so you, that's something to think about as well. And, and that's a whole talk in itself. And I'll leave that for a future talk about the, the, how you return your investment on those. It, the investment's almost always back in, in weight gain during that period. Um, but the background, so you might say, hey, 45 days, why, why, did, why did we choose 45 days? And the next slide kind of explains that. And so, so this is um, uh, morbidity, it means illness, how many sick calves there are. And, and I got this from Dr. Payne, I, I believe it's from a stalker operation. Um, so as, as calves come in, you know, first couple of days, there's not much sickness, but you can see in the first from day four to day 10, there's a big increase in illness, and then it begins leveling off. And you see, if you get up there at about day 45, it pretty much levels off as far as calves getting sick. And so that's kind of the reasoning behind why um, they have chosen 45 days for a backgrounding. It's because by that time, the calves have weaned, they went through the stress of being taken away from their mother and, and now they've kind of settled in and they're starting to get in a rhythm and, and they, they, they're maturing enough to, that they're less likely to get sick. So that's the reason behind uh, the backgrounding of 45 days. Uh, another thing considering is castration and dehorning. And I, I would hope, I would hope um, as certainly as we move forward in, in the industry and we have some more input on animal welfare that castration and dehorning gets done um, much earlier than at weaning. Um, you know, castration early at, at a branding or at a working the cows for AIing or something, if you could do it the earlier the better. Um, you know, if, if what I raise registered bulls, registered animals, um, I, I sometimes let a, let, let a bull go a little longer to determine if we're going to really keep them not, or not as a bull. But I, I, I try to make that decision by two months of age so that I can get a castration done and not have to do it later and add that stress to it. And certainly dehorning is, is, can be pretty stressful. So, you know, in, in the beef world, um, there's, there's 
plenty of homozygous polled cattle in the world to, to take horns off. Uh, we struggle a little more with that in the dairy world because there's just not as many polled animals and, and they tend not to be as productive as the horned animals. But uh, certainly in the, in, hopefully if you thought of this long time ago, earlier in the spring uh, when these calves were being born about castrating and dehorning. Okay, vaccination, once again, preconditioning programs, most of them are requiring multiple doses, you know, initial dose and a booster. Some of them will use the, the first vaccination if you're doing it at branding, you know, at, at two to three months of age, that's considered the first one, and then you can repeat it uh, before weaning or at weaning. Uh, my preference, what we do with our cattle um, we, we do vaccinate them at the time when we're working the cows uh, to send them up to AI. Um, so that's usually in April, um, maybe May, and so they're two to three months of age, two months of age. And then what I like to do is I like to kind of look out and see when I'm going to wean and back up five weeks. And I like to work the calves, give them the first round of uh, vaccinations, wait three weeks, Revaccinate them, booster those, and then I've got about uh, 10 to 14 days before I'm going to wean them. So I've gotten, sometimes I've gotten three rounds of vaccinations in them before they get weaned, and, and I, I would prefer to get that, uh, those rounds in prior to weaning. This year it didn't work out so well. I, I ended up, the, the boosters came at the time we did wean, but ideally I would like to have at least two rounds prior to weaning. So if I'm going to do that, I got to back up about five weeks, work them, three weeks later, booster, and, and within 10 to 14 days, I can wean them. And so I'm, I'm weaning them when they're, and I'll show you some graphs a little later, when that, that immunity is rising quite quickly, and they should, that, that immunity should be quite high during that early period of the weaning process. So you think, well, what, which, which, which pathogens should be of a concern, and, and certainly work with your veterinarian on this uh, to pick out. But the, the typical virals are you know, that the first one's IBR, BBD, BRSV, and, and PI3. Those are pretty standard in, in respiratory vaccines. Um, IBR and BBD have reproductive effects as well. As the most, most preconditioning programs will have the clostridiums, the black leg, uh, and then Mannheimia, which used to be Pastorella, Mannheimia. Um, some of those programs will talk about Histophilus, which used to be Haemophilus. Uh, and then, of course, if, for my heifers that I'm keeping, um, that I'm going to use for breeding, I will use a lepto. And, and a lot of times, that viral component, that IBR, BBD, BRSV, and PI3, will come in a form where you have the lepto in it. And so, because I want that in my heifers, I go ahead and I, I use that with my bulls and my steers and my heifers because it just makes it easier as they're running through the chute, not have to worry about which calf gets which vaccine, we just do all the same. But I like to get that lepto into those heifers at an early age so that they later in life they respond to it quite well. And, and of course then that will, if you do show me select, that'll, that will um, be able to, to meet the requirements for the Show Me Select program. Modified live vaccine versus kill vaccine, and this is something to think about, okay? And, and the difference is here between the two, and I'm gonna show you some graphs um, as well to, to show you the difference. Um, but the modified lives, you have much quicker response to the modified live, and part of that is because a lot of times one dose will get you the immunity you need, whereas the killed usually, almost all killed products require a booster. And I'll show you a graph why. And if you're not going to booster a killed product, you might as well squirt it on the ground, okay? If you're using a killed product, and, and it's okay, and killed products can be work well, but you must factor in that you're going to booster, in which it, most preconditioned programs require a booster, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, the modified lives um, will give you longer immunity, typically, uh, and the kills are a shorter duration. Um, and then the, the 
if we look at the immune system in animals, it, it, if you think of it as having two arms, uh, one arm is the cell-mediated immunity, and one is humoral or the antibodies. Um, so the, the kills do a bad job with cell-mediated, okay? The modified lives do a fantastic job with cell-mediated. And, and for the viruses in particular, the cell-mediated arm of the immune system is, is important. So um, modified live vaccines, you have less reactions than you do with the kill. And part of that is for kills to work well, well you have to add what's called adjuvants to it. And those adjuvants, you're, the animal is more likely to react to the adjuvant than, than the actual organism. Either one, you want to handle carefully. And I'm gonna go through some things in handling vaccines here shortly too, and I'll explain that. Now, the one downside of modified live is pregnancy concerns. So those viruses, IBR, BBD, the cow, the cow must be vaccinated with those prior to breeding, if, to prior to breeding for you to use a modified live on the calf when the calf's still on the cow. So because most of these preconditioning programs require, would want you to vaccinate the animal while on the cow before weaning, this is a factor you gotta take into, uh, in, into account. Okay, so personally, my cows, I use a modified live when I'm working them prior to AI. So they're vaccinated with modified live prior to AI. So I have no trouble with using modified lives in the calves when they're nursing the cow. However, if, if you're gonna just start this program and you don't have any idea what the background or you know the background of the cow has not had any modified live, then talk with your veterinarian and you're probably gonna have to go towards the killed products, okay? So modified live, I like modified lives. Uh, but I, I need to know the backgrounds of the herd before I would decide to use that. So we're going to look at a couple of graphs that show um, the difference between modified live and, and killed. Okay, so this is what I mean when, and when I say if you're going to use killed, uh, you, you, got, you have to, you have to have a plan to booster that. If you use a cat killed and you only do it once, this is the response you get. You get a short period of time where you get some immunity above where they're susceptible and it doesn't last very long. It, it, it comes relatively quickly, but it doesn't last very long and then you're below the line, okay? This is, this is why I don't, this is one of the things I don't like about kill and I don't like about a lot of people saying, oh, I vaccinated them. Well, what did you use? I used a kill. Well, did you booster it? No. Well, I don't know much help you, you got. So now here is what happens when you do it correctly. And, and this is where kills will work well. You have to give the first vaccination, have in your plan where you're going to booster that according to label. They usually it's three to six weeks later. And you can see what can will happen. You get that initial response. And then on the second one, you you ramp up the immune system again. And then that will go much higher, give you much better resistance, and it will last longer. And then a year later, a year later, you don't have to do it twice again. So most kill vaccines, you don't have to do it twice again. There's some you do, but most you don't. And all you have to do annually is, is booster to cause those memory cells to take off again. So this is a really important, okay? If you're using killed, you must booster, all right? The reason, the reason modified lives, you can get away with one, you can get away with one, is you give the vaccine and that, mod, that live virus, live, live organism is gonna, is gonna replicate in the animal. Because it replicates, it it's, will cause the immune system to continue Instead of just looking at it, oh, wow, I got a foreign thing. Um, oh, my goodness, several days, weeks, I'm looking at the same organism. I'm responding, and so I, I, I get a, a continued response. And if we go to the next slide, we see what that is. 
once again here, this is modified live vaccine, ramps up pretty quickly. And then because of the continued exposure, it stays above that. And a year later, you know, annual booster, you can booster it in year and get the same response as well. So that's an advantage of modified live. Okay. You can vaccinate animals. So you vaccinating means you just put the product in there. Immunize, immunize means that they actually responded. Okay. All right. So they've actually responded. And the reason they might not respond is stress, nutritional deficiencies, subclinical diseases. So handling the vaccine. So this is one of my pet peeves is when I go to places and I don't see vaccines handled correctly. Um, you know, people spend money on this vaccine. You're going to, you're going to want it to work. Okay. So when I'm, especially when I'm using modified lives, I'm only going to mix up what I'm going to use in the next hour. Okay. So I'm going to, I usually mix up what a pistol grip syringe will handle. Um, or if I'm using individual, individual syringes and needles, which happens at some places, you know, I'm only, I'm only going to pull up and mix up what I know I'm going to get done in the next 45 to 50 to 60 minutes. And then temperature. Okay. This is really important. Vaccines like cool temperature. All right. And the next slide will show you some options. Um, so I've used these various different options. You have a styrofoam container with, I put ice packs in or just a cooler with ice packs and you're, I got my vaccines, so I'm keeping them cool. Or there's these vac, cattle vac boxes. There's a number of them available. You've got a, a spot where you can have the vaccines and you got a spot where you can put your syringes and um, that you're using and you got ice, ice packs in the bottom. These are really great. Keep the vaccine cool. You don't want to take them out and have them heat up because you, especially modified lives, if, if you heat them up, you go from a really good vaccine to a really poor vaccine. Uh, sunlight, okay, especially modified lives. If you're outside, if you don't have a roof over your, your working facilities, you have a roof, not as big a deal. But if I'm out, like in this producer, I'm, I'm outside. So on the upper left hand, what I'm showing is I, while I'm mixing that vaccine, I'm, I've got my back to the sun so that I'm mixing that in the shadows, okay? And then once I have that mixed, if I'm outside like this and, and I don't have a back, back, uh, back cattle vax box or something, I'm putting a towel around that modified live because once again, I can, if modified live is exposed to sunlight, you go from a really good vaccine to a really poor vaccine. Expiration dates, disinfectants and needles, um, Look at your vaccines when you're buying them. I, when I order vaccine, I always look when I get them in when their expiration is. I, I'm not using any vaccines that are expired. Um, if I'm using modified lives, um, if I'm using modified lives, I never use disinfectants on my, on my syringes. I only use hot water. And then needles, and you know, work with your veterinarian. And if I'm sub-Q, I'm probably going to use a short five-ace, one-half inch, five-ace needle. If I'm going I am, depending on the size of the calf or size of the animal, um, I'll probably pick an inch to an inch and a half, depending on the size of the animal. And records, I, I really recommend keeping track of your records. And records can be, you know, paper, um, hard copies, you know, sometimes I'll do hard copies. And also there's a number of software programs out there now that can be shoot side and you can record what you're doing shoot side. And um, so that's helpful to keep track of when you're doing these things. Um, or a little red book, you write down September 17th, vaccinate all calves with uh, a vaccine. Quickly on to the places we give vaccines. Um, you can give them intranasal. There's some oral vaccines, intramuscular, subcutaneous and, and intradermal works really well, but there's not really a good way of doing it. Um, and so that's not very common. And I, I show here on this bull, um, we, we should keep our vaccines up in the neck region there for beef quality assurance. Sub-Q, you can kind of go behind the leg, the front leg there for sub-Qs, but really if we can stay in the neck region, that's preferable. And we certainly want to stay away from those, those better cuts in the hind end. Uh, just quickly on deworming, um, 
Uh, I would suggest if you're going to look at deworming, run a fecal egg count reduction test on your farm. And that will, your veterinarian would be able to do this. It's, it's where you take some cows and, or calves and you take a fecal sample, deworm them, and come back two weeks later and take another fecal sample and see how much the egg count has reduced. And that will give you a good idea if there's some resistance on your farm. And, um, and so because there is some resistance occurring in the industry, um, it, it's, it would be good. Now, personally, because I've done fecal egg count reduction tests, and, and I, number one, I see we, we don't have much resistance, and two, we don't have a big burden. I, I have probably backed up amount, the amount of deworming I do. Um, and so uh, it's just some general information. And then the last slide I think I got, uh, just to wrap up, um, just some wrapping it up. Don't rely too much on the vaccine program, okay? There's management, don't, you know, fully, you know, if you, if, fully appreciate the disease dynamics and don't underestimate your management decision, decisions, right? I, I can, if I throw my calf into a muddy lot with yearling, yearling animals and they have to fight to get to the bunk and it don't matter how good of a vaccine I have used, I've just overwhelmed the system. So it, it's, don't just look at vaccines, look at the total package.